In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. So we are going to be jumping into Gideon, who is one of the judges. Um, but let's kind of recap on, on our book of Judges. So see a lot of new faces this week, so I'll, I'll just kind of you know, share. So when we look at Judges, when, do, when, do the, when does this take place? in kind of the his, history of Israel? That's kind of a big question. Who remembers that or who knows that? When does the judges take place? So it, I don't know the chronology of like the actual, t- the actual years, but it takes place after the conquest of Canaan. Okay. Speaking. Right, so, so it's after Joshua, which we have the conquest of Canaan. And what was the big, and it's before the, the monarchy. So before Saul, David, and Solomon, right? So this is our middle period. When, um, what was the big mishap in the, in the conquest of Canaan? That they didn't eliminate all the Canaanites. Exactly, right? So the big problem is that they were told to go and eliminate all the Canaanites. And as they... Kind of at the end of Joshua, what happened is that the 12 tribes were, were, they divvied up the land of Canaan to the 12 tribes and everybody got their own parcel of land. And it, it was their responsibility to go and rid the Canaanites from their parcel of land. And what happened was that they didn't. And so, you know, the, the remaining Canaanites in the land essentially became a thorn in their side. Because these were individuals or these were groups of people that worship different gods, different um, idols. There was a variety of different, you know, Gentile and pagan worship throughout the land of Canaan. And, and a lot of times in the book of Judges, we'll see it summed up in, in a plural form of Baal, who, who was the most popular god, okay, or the Gentile god or idol at that time. And then the asterisks. Um, they Baal was a male god or male idol, and Ashtoreth were the female uh, representative of all the female gods. And the land of Canaan was known historically as a very like rough people because of the different idol worship. They were known for child sacrifices, um, and so they were they were known to engage in a lot of hedonistic and and horrible activities which is one of the reasons why God wanted to um, you know, rid the land because he knew that the Israelites just coming out of their 40 years in the wilderness and just beginning to their conquest, they were still a weak nation. So the Lord wanted to rid the nation, but also he was punishing the sin, right? He wasn't like so focused on the people, right? But he was focused on the sin. Um, he wasn't showing preference towards his own people, but then punishing everybody else. And we see that because when his own people sin, what did he do? He came back and he punished his own people, right? And that's why they ended up in the exile for 70 years. So God didn't like the sin. He punished the sin, all right, through his own people. But yet when the sin, when his own people showed or, or did similar things, right, social injustices, he punished his own people, right? So that's kind of the context of Judges. So they're coming in, incomplete conquest. The Canaanites are still there. They become the thorn in the side of the Israelites. And what is, there is a repeating cycle in the book of Judges, right? What is the repeating cycle? Who remembers? You're with us. Cycle that they disobey God. And some foreign armies come in and ravish them. And then they turn to God. He sends them a hero who drives out the enemy. And then it goes over and over and over again. Exactly. Right. So that's that's the cycle. It is the same thing over and over. And there's a literary style that kind of captures this pattern that we'll, we'll see a bit today. Right. But Israel deviates. Then God uses the, the remaining Canaanites to become a thorn in their side or to like punish them. They cry. He raises up a judge. The judge frees them uh, or or kind of gives them a a time of peace. There is a time of peace for the life of the judge. But then once the judge dies, 
then the cycle restarts, right? So that's the whole book. Um, and it's important that we also point out that a judge was a military leader, not somebody who was arbitrating like legal issues for the Israelites. They were a, a military leader. Why they're actually called the judge, not exactly clear, but that's who they were. Okay, any questions? Context, cycle in, in the book of Judges is really important. Um, all right, now I got my questions. Are leaders born or are leaders made? Born a leader or are you made a leader? I would say definitely born. It takes a lot of societal and sociological factors. There's different definitions of a leader. It just depends on societal standards and what's viewed as someone that's per se um, fit to lead. And back then, I think it was someone that could ravage, murder, kill, because it was kind of savage back then. But nowadays, you want someone that can talk and appeal to all kinds of different people, even people that don't necessarily have the same political values. Someone that can virtue signal, cherry pick information, convey ways and things <laughs> that, unedu that uneducated people can understand. All right, so I'm gonna kind of go back to your first part, which was you believe that leaders are born, right? You're, you're a natural born leader. Right? No, I well, I I think they're made because, like, throughout society. <laughs> <laughs> so you're going with leaders are made. Yeah, because Based on throughout that history, there's been different, you know, uh, standards for what a good leader is. It's always changing. Okay. It's always changing. Okay. You said leaders are made. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anybody going to go with leaders? Are, you're born a natural leader. I would say it, it kind of depends on context because some people are born leaders. They're not necessarily born good leaders, but if, especially back then, if you're born of an aristocratic background, if we're going to do a very literalist interpretation, you're born a leader. And if you're from a peasant background, you're most likely not going to be born a leader. You can become one, but you're not likely. So I feel like to be born is based off status. To become is based off personal accomplishments or abilities. What about the kid on the playground who clearly is the leader of the pack? I suppose I could also be born, but isn't that in some way sort of a status or his abilities? I mean, I don't think like you, the, and that's on the playground. I don't think status like holds much ground. Because I mean, that's not that's not the way kids look. But when you know, but you can definitely see within, you know, younger circles of kids that some of them just rise to as, as leaders in the group. Anybody else? I think it's a mix of both. It's, okay. like, it's like saying is an athlete born or made. Mm. It's like they have to have some like born, like they have some talent as like in their genes, but then mm. they also practice. So I think it's a mix of both. Like, All right. So nature and nurture. A little bit of nature and nurture, right? It's an age old argument, right? <laughs> do, you re do we mess up with our kids or are they messed up in the beginning? All right? <laughs> That's kind of the question. Um, so it's interesting, like, you know, it, it's good to think about, and I don't think that there's a right or wrong. I, I'm kind of, of that, like, I think it's both ways. I think so, like some people are just natural born leaders and other people, you know, are born leaders out of the moment and out of what's needed, right? They just somehow something happens within them and they rise to the challenge and they figure out how to lead. Um, but that's just my personal opinion, not right or wrong. All right, next question. Describe a life circumstance that required you to grow in a way that you did not expect. Like what's a life circumstance that challenged you to grow in a way that you did not expect? Having um, children. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> All right. Psychologists made a list of the most stressful life events possible. And I think any of those 
like among those lists was divorce, death, death in the family, being a undergraduate college student, <laughs> student graduate education. I think all of those events would force you to change in a significant way. Like true, but my, my, question is more yeah. like, my question is more like personal reflection on just kind of asking ourselves, asking everybody here to kind of reflect back on a time or a season that challenged you in a way that you weren't expecting to, that forced you to grow. Someone you care for telling you they um, they can't they can't stand you. Okay, and that forced you to grow. I don't know. It didn't happen to me, but I'm thinking of a significant event. Like if someone you care for were to tell you that you can't stand you, force you to ponder on what kind of person you were. Okay. Again, this is more of like a personal reflection. Just somebody's able to kind of share. Oh, Buddha. Yep. Uh, I would say uh, kind of what Sarah said, having a kid. But I, uh, I had mine very early um, and unexpectedly. Uh, and I was 23 years old and I was a bum. And uh, I washed cars for a living. And she forced me to... Uh, grow up and then 41 days into her life uh, I got her baptized and that forced me to grow up even more because I swore in front of God and everybody else that I would teach her about God and protect her um, and yeah especially when you have a kid and you weren't expecting her <laughs> it, it forces you it forced me I was I was doing dumb stuff uh, before she came around Absolutely. Thanks, man. Thanks for sharing. Anybody else? Um, a significant life change for me. I think, I mean, it was fitness wise and it was also emotional, but my doctor told me I was going on the wrong path. I had to change my eating habits and my lifestyle. It was also an emotional thing because staying away from the things you want is kind of like abstaining in a way. Mm -hmm. Very good. All right. And so kind of just to keep us moving because we got a lot of text to read, but as everybody's hopefully thinking or reflecting on a time that was unexpected, you know, that forced them to grow, would you consider that a growth in your own leadership, right? And it could be self-leadership, right? And personal leadership is, if you will, like the hardest form of leadership. Because if you can't govern the self, how can you govern or watch over others, right? So personal leadership is, you know, where real, leader, real leadership begins. And all these different, you know, life circumstances that we're faced with really challenge us to grow, right? Whether we're, we're naturally good at it or not. So as we kind of hold on that, let's kind of jump into our text. We're gonna be reading from Judges chapter six, right? And Judges chapter five concludes the story of Deborah. And we looked at Deborah last week, right? And she was the one who led Israel to victory alongside Barak, who was a military leader at the time. And before we jump into six, I'll just point out that the very last line of chapter five, um, you know, reads, so the land had rest for 40 years, right? And this is, you know, we understand that as, okay, this is for as long as Deborah continued to live, there was peace in the land, right? And then let's we're going to start off by reading a big chunk uh, of the first chapter. We're going to read the first 10 verses of Judges chapter 6, verses 1 through 10. And I'll just highlight quickly at the beginning where it says, then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, right? And, and these two kind of sentences back to back are, are repeated throughout, right? Which tell us that, okay, cycle is, is beginning again, right? So if somebody can... Read verses six, or sorry, Judges chapter six, verses one through 10. And what I want you to, 
you know, try and focus on is like some of the details, if you will, and, and what, what situation it has put the Israelites in, right? So really paying attention to this sort of punishment that is being brought to them because of their evil that they did inside of the world, all right? Because that, that's going to help us understand more of the context of Gideon. So, so let me read uh, verses 1 through 10, chapter 6. Um, the people of Israel um, did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord gave them into the hand of, of Median uh, seven years. And the hand of Median overpowered Israel. And because of Median, the people of Israel made for themselves the tents and, uh, that are in the mountains and, and the caves and uh, 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 strongholds. Uh, for whenever the, uh, the Israelites planted crops, the, the, the Midianites and the uh, uh, Amal um, Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them. Uh, they would uh, encamp against them and uh, deport them to the, the previous of the land. As for as Gaza and leave, and leave no uh, uh, sustenance, sustenance in Israel and no sheep, uh, sheep or sheep or, or ox or donkey. Uh, for they would co come up with their uh, livestock and uh, in their tents, they would uh, come like uh, lo locusts in numbers, number both. They and their camels could not be, be counted. So that they laid waste at the land as they come in. And Israel was brought very low because of the, and the people of Israel cried out for the help of the Lord. When the people of Israel cried out to the Lord uh, on account of the Midianites, the, the, and the Lord sent a prophet to the people of Israel. And he said to them, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I led up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of, of slavery. I have delivered you from the hand, hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of all who, who oppressed you and, and drove them out before you and give you their land. And I said to you, I am the Lord, your God. You shall not fear the gods of the uh, uh, Amorite, Amorites in, in whose land uh, you dwell. But you have not obeyed my voice. Great. Thank you. Okay. So what's happening? Like, how are they being oppressed? Um. The people would take their produce and destroy it. Mm -hmm. And they would leave them with nothing. Yeah. yeah. Right. So this was, if you will, like a calculated attack. Because when you think of, and, and I had a map, but like where, like the, the geography of what we're describing is there's a valley and there's a river in the valley. So clearly that is a place where you would, you would grow the harvest, right? And you have the Midianites and the Amalekites and other inhabitants of the land who, after the Israelites have farmed and, and gotten ready for the harvest, they're coming in right at harvest time and they're displacing the Israelites because there's so many of them. They're reaping of the harvest and then they're essentially just leaving the land to laid waste, right? And the harvest was what they gathered for like the, the year. So when they would come year after year, and, and what it says for seven years, they would come, they would take the harvest, and they would displace the Israelites. You're talking about such a bad economy. I mean, how much, like now, we go to the grocery store, and you're like, you want me to pay $10 for eggs? Right? This is like, we're feeling it. We're feeling like, okay, this is difficult. Imagine that for seven years, like the stress that it's going to put on us. It's, it was probably so much worse. For them, because their resources were little, they were weak, you know, as, as a nation, and then just kept on getting displaced. And they got displaced up to the mountains, right, in, in the caves. So that's where they were living. That's what's going on. And then what do we get in verse 7? Is it came to pass when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord because of the Midian. So finally, enough is enough. We see the cycle starting. They're starting to cry. But instead of, like, responding right away to them, he sends them a prophet and says, but this is what you were warned about. 
right? Told you about this. You needed to have trusted me from the beginning to rid the nation, right? To rid the land of the Canaanites, but you didn't, right? So that's where we're at. Um, any questions? That's our setting right now. Now let's go to read our introduction to Gideon. This is our first uh, clips, or glimpse of Gideon. And we're going to read 11 through 13. And I agree with you guys. That heater is not blowing the hair over or the hot air. So let's turn this one on and just make sure we talk about it. All right. So who can read Gideon? Uh, or Sorry, Judges 6, 11 through 13. Okay. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree, which was in Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Bezerite. And while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the wine press in order to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Gideon said to him, O oh my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his miracles, which our fathers told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. All right, awesome. So, What's Gideon doing? Saying the Lord has successfully delivered them? No. Nope. He's saying, where are you, Lord? But but before we get to that, what is he physically doing? Threshing wheat in secret. Yeah, he's threshing wheat in secret, right? And he's doing it where they press wine, right? Not on the threshing floor. He's doing it in a different place. Right. So he's trying to be inconspicuous about how he is getting his food and his sustenance. Right. And I can imagine that when you're trying to thresh wheat where you press wine, it's probably not a good mix. Right. Your, your barley is going to taste like wine. Right. And I'm sure there's some additional complications to that. All right. So with that in mind, my question, follow up question is. He's introduced to us or at least the angel of the Lord appears to him and said, you mighty man of valor, right? How would you define valor? What is valor? I would say it's generally bravery and courage in the face of battle. All right. Yeah, it generally has a martial uh, aspect to it. Okay, agreed. And who would you who would you describe as somebody of valor? Like a soldier or leader. Exactly, right? A soldier or leader, and not just any soldier or leader, a soldier or leader who has proven himself in, in battle, right? So you would wait for somebody to prove themselves, and then they would earn that title or description of being somebody of valor, right? Now give me, with the little that we know about Gideon, how would you build his character? Like if you're going to give him a character profile, like if you ever watch like these, you know, murder mysteries or NCIS, there's always like these profiling of characters. How would you profile Gideon right now? Doubtful. What? Doubtful. Okay, he's doubtful. He's doubtful that the Lord is even there. Okay. Confused. Okay. He doesn't seem particularly brave in the sense that he's basically hiding so he can have food for himself as opposed to actually, you know, being out in the open and challenging. Their enemies. Okay. He's hiding, right? I was actually going to ask if the angel is is saying calling him a man of valor out of sarcasm, but I don't know if the <laughs> angel uh, does that. <laughs> <laughs> so can angels be sarcastic is like another question, but um, okay, so that's a good perspective. Let's get like I'll get to that, but how else would you build Gideon's character? He doesn't come across as extremely trusting. Okay, he's not trusting. And what, what points you at that? Because, I mean, maybe I wouldn't necessarily trust a someone, an angel or whatever just came up to me, but 
he doesn't believe the word initially when he's told. Okay, so he doesn't believe the word initially. And what, what's his reasoning for not believing the angel? The reason he gives is that because God hasn't acted in the way that he would have wanted in the past. Uh, that, uh, right. He doesn't so he, see why he would act. pointing the finger back. Yeah. Saying, oh, wait, like, you're saying the Lord is with us, but look at everything that happened. So how could he be with us? Right. So he's pointing it and saying, but now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midian. Right. So so he's kind of pointing back. He's blaming. He's not taking any responsibility for any of the things that his people have done. Right. Or that his countrymen have done. Right. So this is a bit of the, the character profile. Now I'm going to jump back to, to Nikki's point where he's like, OK, was the angel being sarcastic? Right. Or. OK, why not? Okay. All right. I like that. We're going to read in a couple, uh, another couple of verses, and then we're going to kind of finish off this question, right? Let's read verses 14 through 17. Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this land of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hands of the Midianites. Have I not sent to you? So he said to him, O my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my plan is to visit Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. And he said to him, If now I have found favor in your sight, and show me the sign that, it's, that it is you who talk to me. Do not depart from me. Okay, great. So, so he's saying like, okay, go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the rain. Okay. So similar to what you're saying is that like, okay, somebody who's kind of lost their courage along the way, like the angel's trying to speak it out. If, if you are, did I capture your thoughts correctly? Think to the New Testament on somebody that was spoken to. No, all right, that was spoken to and given a name that he had yet to really like step into, like really fulfill. Joseph. New Testament. Zachariah. No. Peter. 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 Right. What was what was Peter's name? The rock. The rock. <laughs> Peter was everything but a rock at the beginning. But he was given that name, Ross. And, and the Lord said, like, and on this rock, I will build my church. Right. So it's coming. But Peter had a lot of growing pains along the ways. Right. There was nobody who kind of put his like opened his mouth and put his foot in his mouth more times than Peter. Right. He spoke boldly, but acted cowardly. Right? Peter had a lot to, to grow in before actually becoming the rock. But the Lord saw it in him and he said, okay, you're the rock. You're the rock that I'm going to build the church of. So he's looking at Gideon in a similar way and saying, like, you man of valor, you don't see it and we don't see it yet, but it's there. So what we're going to see in this process is that the Lord is going to bring this out of him. Right? You don't see the valor. But I see it. Okay. And the Lord does the same to us. He looks at each one of them, you like in, in our own ways. Like, I love the example that was given about like, okay, parenting. Like, sometimes you look like, I don't have the strength for this, but the Lord says, I'm going to bring it out of you. Right. You're going to find the way to do it. Right. If like you're going or starting a graduate program, right, you get in there and the first couple of months you're like drinking out of fire hydrant. And you're like, I don't know how I'm going to make this through. I don't know how I'm going to survive. He pulls it out of us, right? And he gets us through. So in many different ways, like in our own respective circles, like he figures out how to pull what we don't know is there out of us, right? And he sees it. We don't, right? In our marriages, like we, we clash in our marriages sometimes. He's like, okay, 
I'm going to pull some like compassion out of you. I'm going to pull some patience out of you. And I'm going to make this marriage work. Right? You're aloof. I'm going to like bring responsibility out of you. Okay? So in all of our situations, like God looks and he says, it's in there, but I got to get it out. Okay? All right. So Gideon, as we're kind of building our, our character profile, Gideon, right, says um, at the end of verse 17, where he says, like, okay, then he said to him, if now I have found favor in your sight, then show me a sign that it is you who talk with me, right? And just to kind of think of this idea of valor with respect to Gideon, valor is a term that you give to a soldier who's proven himself in battle. A soldier who's proven himself in battle, battle understands orders, understands direction. Gideon is like, okay, I kind of hear what you're saying, but I'm not sure that I totally believe it. And I'm not sure if I really want to follow it, but I need a sign, right? That's not valor. That's not valor. So the Lord is going to say, okay, I'm going to be patient. And I'm going to pull it out. So what happens is that Gideon would go prepare young goat and bread, and then he would build an altar. And then he would set the bread and the meat on the altar and pour the broth that was used to prepare the meat over it. And the angel of the Lord would stick out the staff and from the rock bring fire, right? And consume the sacrifice. And that's how Gideon would know or begin to know that, okay, this is God who is coming and God who is, is you know, commanding him to go, All right? Now let's read verses 22 through 24. Now Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord. So Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. And the Lord said to him, Peace be with you. Do not fear, you shall not die. So Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it, The Lord is free. Right. So Gideon, or God, is actively trying to calm Gideon's fear. Right? So, like, the perception is that you see God, then you die. But the, you know, Gideon is like, all right, I've seen the angel of the Lord. That's got to be pretty close to death. But the Lord says, no, no, just relax. All right. You know, calm down. And one of Gideon's first assignments, okay, was to begin to address the root problem, which the root problem was really not the Amalekites or the Midianites. What's the root problem? Um, so. Okay, falling into sin, right? And that sin is coming because they had false gods like set up all around them. So his first assignment was to go to his father's house and, and tear down this altar of, of Baal that was in his father's house, all right? And so verses 25 through 27 is how he completed it. But I want to read it. And then you tell me like, okay, what, what are we learning about Gideon, All right? Let, let, let's kind of ask ourselves like, okay, what's Gideon doing or how is Gideon changing? Verses 25 through 27 of chapter six. I'm guessing nobody online is reading because everybody's using their phone to join in and their Bible's on their phone, right? If you got your Bible online. Like, yeah. um, that night, the Lord said to him, take your father's bowl. And the second bull set that seven years old and pull down the altar of, of Baal that your father has and cut down uh, the, the Sherah that, uh, that is beside it and, and build an altar to the Lord your God on the top of the uh, stronghold here with stones laid up uh, in the order. Then take the second bull and offer it as burnt offer, offering with the wood of the, uh, of the, uh, of the Asherah uh, that you shall cut, cut down. So, uh, so uh, Gideon took 10 men uh, of, his, of his servants and did as the Lord had told him. But because he was too afraid of his family and the men of the uh, town to do it by the day, he did it by night. All right. So what, like, what are we learning about Gideon? Yeah. Like, 
Okay. Okay. All right. I agree. Well, when we look at these verses of what he did, so he went and he, he tore down the altar. But how did he do it? And when did he do it? Right. He did it at night. Why? He's chicken. He's chicken. All right. He wants to do it, but he's just like, okay, but if I do it in the middle of the day, like it's going to be a problem. So let me do it in the middle of the night. All right. It's okay. All right. What we're going to see here is the growth of Gideon. And growth doesn't happen quickly. Like this story unfolds pretty quickly, but like our growth and what God is trying to pull out of us takes time. And so sometimes we do it like so so. We kind of listen to what he's saying, but we do it in a way that we're comfortable with. Gideon is growing. He knows that, like, okay, he's a man of valor. And he's like, okay, you want me to tear down the, uh, the, the ball's idol? I'll do it, but let me do it at night. I don't want anybody to see it, right? Because I don't want the, the repercussions of it, right? So he's kind of chicken, but he, he's kind of grown, right? This is it. But, like, we're all like this. We're all like this. And, you know, he's taking positive steps, but there's this cloak of fear still surrounding Gideon, right? And, and, and one of the things that we're going to see is, like, with this cloud or this cloak of fear over Gideon, it's going to take several steps to kind of break through it, right? It's going to take several steps to break through it. And it's just like God bringing the, the qualities out of us. It's going to take painful steps to, for us to break through, right? But in this process, he would learn, he would earn a nickname, right? And the, and the nickname, which we might read it, um, in the upcoming verses is Jeruba, right? Jeruba, which means let Baal plead against him because he has torn down his altar. I don't know how they get all those words out of like one word, Jeruba, but <laughs> essentially the nickname is to say, okay, you know, people came and said, why'd you knock down Baal's altar? And they said, well, well Baal's a god, like make him plead for himself, like let him stand up and, and do something for himself. And clearly there's no response. So they kind of make a, a, a pun out of it or a joke out of it and said, let Baal plead against, him. right? So Gideon won one, all right? But Gideon, like, like we're saying, still has this cloak of fear, all right? So let's look. We're going to jump to verses 36, and we're going to read 36 through 40 in chapter 6, all right? It'll be the end of it, of chapter 6. But again, like... We'll see how Gideon, like what Gideon needs, all right, and how God responds. So, anybody online? Yes, I can do it. 36 through 40. Gideon said to God, if you will save Israel by my hand, as you have promised, look, I will place a wool fleece on the, on the threshing floor. If there is dew only on the fleece and all the ground is dry, then I will know that you will save Israel by my hand. As you said, and that is what happened. Gideon rose early the next day. He squeezed the fleece and wrung out the dew, a bowlful of water. Then Gideon said to God, do not be angry with me. Let me make just one more request. Allow me one more test with the fleece. This time make the fleece dry and the ground covered with dew. That night God did so. Only the fleece was dry. All the ground was covered with dew. All right, thanks. All right, so there's this beautiful like picture of of like the scene between God and, and Gideon, right? Where Gideon is like, okay, I'm getting there, but I need a sign. Like, and how many of us, like, if God were to give us like one sign, we'd be like, yes. I mean, Gideon's got the courage to like say, okay, give me two signs, right? Give me two signs. Like, I'll put the fleece out, make the fleece wet, and the ground dry, and then. The opposite night, like flip it, right? Make the fleece dry and the, the ground full of dew. But I think this the story tells us about Gideon, but it also tells us about God. Right? It tells us about like how patient he is in working with us, right? And understanding the things that we struggle with. And he is so forgiving, right? He's so forgiving of kind of our questions, our doubts, our inability to, to move forward, to be obedient, whatever the situation may be like, 
hey, he understands we struggle and we need certain reassurances. It all depends on like what he is trying to pull out, you know, that he sees like what we need. But he responds. Not every time, okay? But he responds appropriately to us, right? To me as an individual. And he responded to Gideon. And, and this is all because he's trying to bring his valor out of him. But a big part of bringing that valor out of him is going to be trust, right? Because of what God is about to do next. He needs to build this relationship of trust between Gideon and God. And so God has done like a, a, good, a good thing for Gideon because the next thing like God is going to do to Gideon is really going to change him. Okay, so while we ask for signs and we ask for like God's like mercy, like he'll give it to us. But it's because he's preparing us for something big. Right. He never wants us to stay put. He's going to challenge us to grow. Right. Now let's read. We're going to jump into uh, seven, uh, chapter seven, but just kind of in the backdrop of, of what. Of, of this kind of scene with the fleece, right? Gideon had sent messages to the surrounding uh, tribes and said, okay, come, we need your help, all right? So while this situation of the fleece is happening, the, the soldiers from the surrounding tribes have come and gathered and they met with Gideon, all right? Because he was preparing them for, for battle. And that's where we pick up in chapter seven, all right? So let's read the first two verses. I'll go ahead and read the first two verses of chapter seven. Then Jerubal, that is Gideon, and all the people who were with him rose early and encamped beside the wall of Harun, so that the camp of the Midianites was on the north side of them by the hill of Moreh in the valley. And the Lord said to Gideon, the people who are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into into their hands, lest Israel claim glory for itself against me, saying, my own hand has saved me. Right? So we get this picture that, okay, Gideon has kind of gotten this army together, and he's feeling like probably okay because they're, they're going and they're, they're kind of scouting out what the potential battle will be. And just to kind of bring this to our mind, like, how were the, the Midianites and the Amalekites described? They're described as locusts. Right? That's an uncountable number. Right? But God's message is consistent. Right? He wants to leave no doubt in their mind that it's him who's going to deliver them. Right? And we've seen this before. How did he bring them out of Exodus? In a way that only God can do. Right? So that they couldn't say, like, well, we did this and we kind of helped in this way. Like, no, none of you split the Red Sea. None of you killed the firstborn. None of you darkened the, the, you know, the sun for, for three days. None of you did that. That was me. For you to know me. Right? So God is consistent in what he's doing with them. And what did he say, like, to them, even, you know, when they're beginning the, the conquest of land? It's like, I'm going to be with you and I will deliver this land into your hand. Right? Clearly, the odds were against them. Right? And they didn't follow through. And God is saying, like, okay, but had you trusted me and really, like, seen, the, like, seen through the conquest of the land, we would not be in this situation, and I would have helped you. Right? So whenever the odds are against us, God is always there to say, don't worry. This is my specialty. I'm not asking you to figure it out. I will figure it out. Right? But I need you to trust me. All right. Now let's. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the example, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing people didn't hear it online. All right. But the example that was brought up, okay, was about St. Thomas. How. You know, you know, the Lord wanted to confirm his faith in him, right? So he reappeared to show him the, the nail prints and, and, and the, the wound in the side. And that was important because St. Thomas was sent to, anybody remember? 
India, India right? Yeah. The land of thousands of gods. So St. Thomas had to make the confession that I believe in the one true God. And so that was key for St. Thomas, right? So that's a good point. All right, let's read three through seven. All right, three through seven. Now, therefore, proclaim in the hearing of the people, saying, whoever is fearful and afraid, let him turn and depart at once from Mount Gilead. And 22,000 of the people returned and 10,000 remained. But the Lord said to Gideon, the people who, who the people are still too many, bring them down to the water and I will test them for you there. Then it will be that of whom I say to you, this one shall go with you. The same shall go with you, and of whoever I, whomever I say, this one shall not go with you. The same shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water, and the Lord said to Gideon, "Everyone who laps from the water with his tongue, as a dog laps, you shall set apart by himself. Likewise, everyone who gets down on his knees to drink." And the number of those who lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, was three hundred men. But all the rest of the men got down on their knees to drink water. Then the Lord said to Gideon, by the 300 men who lapped, I will save you and deliver the Midianites into your hand. Let all the other people go, every man to his place. All right. So let's be honest. Gideon was skittish to begin with. All right. Dealing with a lot of fear issues here. The Midianites, as we were saying, like described as the locusts, you know, filling the valley. So it's just like swarms of people uncounted. How many men, I don't know if, if you caught it, how many men did um, Gideon start off with? Didn't they say at 300? That's what he ended with. What did he start off with? A thousand? It was close. 32,000? About 30, 32, 33,000. Right? And, and I mean, the Lord is saying, like, there's too many. And and fair enough, like, you know, because having the higher elevation is clearly an advantage in battle. Right? But to have, you know, 33,000 men, you could you could make an argument, okay, with a good strategy, like you can defeat the people in, in the in the valley. Right? But it takes them from 32,000. And then what what was the first way that he um, said like okay just go and ask him like anybody who's afraid you can go home twenty two thousand people left right but at least you're left with the ten thousand who are brave right right and then they go down and they lap at the water and I guess like it's a three hundred that lap like drink water like dogs right and then uh, another ten thousand or so are just on their knees and, and kind of bringing water up to their mouth. It's kind of the picture that I get. And those 10,000 are left. And essentially those who drink like dogs are the ones who are left to bat, right? So like Gideon, I mean, put yourself in Gideon's shoes. Like, okay, I'm trying to overcome fear, God. This is probably not the best way to help me like overcome my fear. So take my 32,000 down to 300. I can come up with better ways for you to teach me to be brave, but this seems insane, right? That's the situation that we're looking at. But what comes next is really nice, okay? It's really nice because up until now, we have Gideon who is saying like, okay, like I want to believe or make a believer out of him. Okay, go get the sacrifice and I'll like the sacrifice. Right. Okay. Like, I want to believe, make a believer out of me. Like, let's play this game with the fleece. And he's like, okay, we'll do the game with the fleece. Then Gideon's like, okay, how many more times can I ask God for a sign? But like, you just took me down to 300 men. Like, I'm going to need something. But Gideon doesn't ask for what's next. Right. Gideon doesn't ask for what's next. The Lord sees Gideon and says something really sweet. Let's look at verses 9 through 11. And it happened on the same night that the Lord said to him, Arise, go down against the camp, for I have delivered them into your hands. 
But if you are afraid to go down, go down to the camp with Pura, your servant, and you shall hear what they say. And afterwards, your hand shall be strengthened to go down against the camp. And he went down with the Pura, his servant, to the outpost of the armed men who were in the camp. Right? And then he's sitting there at the outpost of the camp. He's listening in. And he hears one guy come up and say, you not believe the dream that I had. I was dreaming that a loaf of barley like rolled into our camp and landed on one of the tents and the tent fell down. And the guy sitting next to him, it sounds like a bar scene, to be honest, right? The guy sitting next to him was like, this is none other than the hand or the sword of Gideon, you know, subduing the Midianites. The Lord has given the Midianites into Gideon's hand. Right, that was the interpretation of the dream. And Gideon hears this. And he's comforted. Right? But what's so nice is that like Lord knows what he's putting Gideon through. Right? Take him from 32 to 300, 32,300. That's huge. Especially for somebody struggling with fear. That's a big thing. But he's like, all right, I'm going to help you out this time. I'm going to reassure you that I know what I'm doing and I need you to trust me. Right? So he sends him down to hear this and get in the strength. Right? It's a nice touch because while we can ask for God to show us signs and, and, and to strengthen us, there are times where he's like, okay, I know you and I'm going to give you this before, and, and you don't even know that you need it. Right? I'm going to give you this break. I'm going to help you out with this person. And out of nowhere, this help is going to like come to you. Right? He senses this all the time, right? Because he sees us intimately and he knows us. When he sends it, like how he sends it, that's the beauty of God, right? That's like him being masterful. That's him being the artist of life, knowing when we need it and by whom and through whom and in what way. That's him. It always comes right on time. It always feels late to us, right? It always feels like, oh, I really needed this a little bit ago. But he's like, no, you need to do it right now, right? So he gives us to Gideon. And now let's read 15 through 17. Or sorry, 15 through 21. And so it was when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and the interpretation that he worshipped. He returned to the camp of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord has delivered the camp of Midian into your hands. Then he divided the 300 men into three companies, and he put a trumpet into every man's hand with empty pitchers and torches inside the pitchers. And he said to them, Look at me and do likewise. Watch, and when I come to the edge of the camp, you shall do as I do. When I blow the trumpet, I and all who are with me, then you also blow the trumpets on every side of the whole camp and say, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. So Gideon and the hundred men who were with him came to the outpost of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch, just as they had posted the watch. And they blew the trumpets and broke the pictures that were in their hands. Then the three companies blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers. They held the torches in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hand for, for blowing. And they cried, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And every man stood in his place all around the camp. And the whole army ran and cried out and fled. Right. So it's always interesting to kind of put this like mental picture of what's happening and like I've, I've looked at it different ways, but it's just kind of like my, the way I see this unfolding. Like, so, so he sets them up into three groups, probably three even groups of a hundred and they have the pitchers, they have the torches and trumpets. And essentially like, it seems like they just create mass chaos that they multiply the perception of how many people are there by smashing the pitchers and blowing the trumpets it makes you like get a sense of like, whoa, we're about to be overtaken, right? So it creates this, this confusion among the army. And as we've seen it before, you know, the, the army gets confused 
and they start to attack each other. And in this like mass hysteria, they start to flee. Right. The Mongolian army did the same thing. They the soldiers would have their wives and children piggyback the horses to make the army seem three times as big. No idea. There we go. All right. It's a common war strategy, apparently. Um, all right. And and what we have here is in, in chapter eight, which we're really not going to read much of, right? We do get this picture that, okay, valor has really come to Gideon because not only does he's won the battle, but he goes after the you know four key princes of, of the surrounding areas. And essentially he pursues them until he kills them. And he's outnumbered and, and some of the armies have like, you know, 10 plus thousand, but there's, these, these are value 300 that go. And they're clearly feeling, you know, energized by, by winning the victory. So he captures these, these four, kills them, right? And, and that kind of concludes the battle, all right? But like I was saying before, and, and I said it last week, is that each one of these judges has something about them that just makes you go, huh? Like, it, it's hard to reconcile. And as much as like I want to stop uh, it's nine o'clock, right? As much as I want to stop now, I do want to share this element of Gideon because it, well, I don't have like a clear answer as to like why this happened or, you know, what this says about Gideon. I think it is important to see that all of God's chosen leaders, like they have, they all have defects in one way or another, right? Every leader has a defect. Right. And, and Gideon's defect was a bit strange. Right. And I'm going to sum it up. OK. Uh, but if, if you want to go back and read it, it's in chapter eight and it's um, verses 22 through 28. Right. So on the heels of winning the battle and killing the princes, the people of Israel come to Gideon and say, OK, rule over us, you and your son. Right. But Gideon says to them, I'm not going to rule over you. And my son is not going to rule over you. Right? The Lord shall rule over you, which is really nice. Okay. But then Gideon does something like strange where he says, Okay, the only thing I'm going to ask of you is to give me all the earrings that you found from looting the camp, right? Which is common practice. After you win the battle, you loot the camp. And so all the men say, Okay, we'll do that. So Gideon kind of puts himself in the position of a leader, because the only place that you would, you know, we see this happening is in, okay, they loot the camp and they give it to the king, right? But he's not willing to take that role as a king, but he wants, if you will, the booty from him. And with all the gold that he collects from everybody, he builds the, or he makes it into an ephod, okay? And he sets it up in, you know, his city, what, what, what's termed his city. And when I was reading the, the commentaries on this, an ephod traditionally was known as a garb of the priest, of the Levitical priesthood. But it's suspected that what he is making here is called an ephod, but not necessarily an ephod in, in the sense that it is a garb or garment of a Levitical priesthood. It's more so used as like a, as a sign of power or recognition, right? And essentially this becomes the beginning of, of Gideon's downfall, right? Is that he created something else to worship other than gold, right? In this golden ether. And- You made a robe out of gold? Uh, not a robot, like it, it wasn't a, an idol, right? Per se. But he made something that took the people's attention away from them, which is, I think, the, the key take-home point, right? And if we um, read verse 27, it says, Then Gideon made it into an ephod and set it up in his own city, and all Israel played the harlot with, with it there. It became a snare to Gideon and to his house, right? So it's just kind of like this ending to the story of just like, okay, you became a mighty man of valor. We see that. Right, you displayed valor, but then you come back and you do this like thing 
which is hard to reconcile. And the only reason why I want to bring it up is that, you know, each one of us, God is pulling something out of us, right? He's pulling valor out of one of us, patience out of another, leadership out of another. Like, he's always pulling something out of us. But each one of us has something that is just off, right? Our own kind of defect. But despite our defects, God continues to work with us, seeing the good, seeing the potential. Right, but we have to also be aware of our own defects, and this is where our spiritual practices really come into play. Because, in in kind of knowing what we're weak at, knowing what our shortcoming is, and learning to tame the passions of our hearts, is how, not like, is how when God pulls something out of us, we maintain it and build on it. What we have is getting like God pulled valor out of him. But then he lost it because he wasn't careful. And we see this like trajectory of people a lot. Like God grows and God builds us up and God leads us to something. And then we're not careful and we taint, right? Solomon was a great example of that. God built, right? Built him up, gave him wisdom, but then he tanked at the end. We need to learn to tame the passions of our hearts. To continue to grow and build on what God is pulling out of us. Right? If we don't pay attention to those defects, like they were for Gideon, there'll be a snare to us. Five minutes over, I apologize. Uh, I'm going to close in prayer, and if there's any questions, I'll take it. Um, you know, in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and God, amen. We thank you, Lord, for all your blessings this day and this opportunity to grow together. And we ask you, Lord, to um, for us to be, give us the strength to be faithful as you are pulling different qualities and characteristics out of us. You are making us all into leaders in, in different ways, in, in ways that are natural to us, in ways that are unnatural to us. Um, help us to be patient and um, in that journey with you, but help us to guard our hearts from, from the little things that can pull us in. We see it time and time in, in history and we see it in our own lives. So Lord, help us to tame the passions of our hearts so that we may uh, stay the course and grow with you uh, in the way that you decide through the intercession of your saints who please you from the beginning. Here it says, We say our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy own be done, on earth is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, give us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not to temptation, but to remission of evil. Christ Jesus, our Lord, for thine is kingdom, and the power of the Lord, and the power of the Lord.